welcome to Access Sports at Lakers. I'm Allie Clifton. I'm joined by our Lakers insider, Mike Bresnahan. And from The Athletic, it's BK, Ryan Kamenetsky. BK, good to see you. Good to see you guys. BK, kind of going with the uh, minimalist effect right there. What's over your left shoulder, though? <laughs> uh, my left shoulder, this is, um, that looks like a, what do you call those things, like like dream catchers or something oh, sure. like that? Oh, well, yeah. Something like kid name, like third grade. Okay. I love wow. it. You got to find a quiet. Look, I got three kids. You got to find whatever quiet spot you can. Absolutely. So I'm currently doing this from my kids' uh, little school desk in the corner of their room. Can't go downstairs. Too loud. Amazing. These are the best stories. BK Yesterday, Brazen. it was Mark and all of his books <laughs> right. or fake books. We got the dream catcher. BK, good to see you. The little kids' desk. <laughs> Let's Even get this better. thing rocking. Less than two <laughs> months. That's all the time the Lakers had to rest before getting right back at it. Frank Vogel was asked today how he balances live action versus drill work in practice. No, it makes me want to do less live work, actually, uh, just out of uh, concern for um, you know making sure that our our, our players are not put in uh, you know a situation where they could be vulnerable to injury. You know, if your body's not used to playing live basketball. Uh, like you typically would be uh, building up to a normal a normal training camp. I think you have to take it slower, uh, do more drill work, try to put your system in uh, through drill work uh, as much as possible, and then you know introduce the live action uh, sort of at a slower pace uh, to get their bodies used to uh, contact again. Basically, just went day by day. Uh, I thought about getting in the gym because we're figuring out uh, us playing you know, uh, season starting this early, you know, uh, I think I didn't get a touch of basketball until I got back to L.A. Uh, and then just started doing some, like individual workouts and stuff, like just to get back in the regiment uh, and the rhythm. Uh, but no, nah, I didn't touch a ball at all once I left the bubble. Yeah, it's a quick turnaround, um, you know, especially for us in Miami. But there's nothing we can do about it. We got to get ready. Um, Coach has done a great job of making sure that we ramp up. Um, you know the right way and not going crazy. You know the first day, first couple of days of camp, uh, we've been kind of slowly getting back into the swing of things uh, while also getting work in. So um, it's crazy not to be able to, uh, you know, kind of really celebrate and have a parade and things like that with the fans and, and the city. But you know, it's something that we uh, have to just get through, um, be able to come out and, and you know defend our title. Uh, as well as making sure that you know we stay fresh and get ready um, for Friday. Do you know if LeBron and AD are going to play in the first preseason game on Friday? Uh, we haven't made that decision yet. I would say it's uh, probably unlikely that they'll play. All right, so KCP didn't touch a basketball until he got back to L.A. Markeith Morris said the same thing to us a few days ago. BK, we just heard Frank say right there that it's unlikely we see AD and LeBron in the Lakers preseason game number one on Friday. How do you see him navigating the minutes here in practice and preseason? Yeah, you know, he's going to have to be really careful. I, I know the Lakers talked last year, and I really surprised a lot of people with how aggressively they came out of the gate trying to win games. And, and they, they put the, the pedal down really fast. They just can't do it again this year. They're going to have to be much more cautious with everyone, not just LeBron and AD. But, you know, you, you talk, you know, KCP, I mean, all these guys came out of the bubble. They had their bumps and bruises. None of them are in shape. None of them have played the pickup games that NBA players typically do. They're going to have to be very careful pushing out minutes. You know, you'll see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, THT. You'll see a lot of Devontae Kaycock in the preseason. The younger guys, you know, they're, they're going to get some run. And I think, Brez, to that point, you actually talked, I believe, with Frank today about that, kind of divvying up those minutes. Mm -hmm. How do you see him kind of dispersing them? And will anything we see in the preseason look like what we might see on opening night? You know, Frank was pretty funny when I asked him. He basically said, look, I know what these guys are like. Even if they haven't been on our team, uh, specifically, you know, like a Schroeder or a Harrell, he's been watching the NBA long enough and these guys long enough to know exactly what they can do on the court. So we said, you know, we're going to get some of these guys in, but don't expect a lot from some of the bigger names, uh, definitely in the, in the preseason opener. On the other hand, he said, OK, I've seen him play. We don't need to get him a ton of time in the preseason, but eventually we will need to get all these guys on the same page. So he has to kind of straddle a pretty fine line, uh, getting, getting these guys uh, on the court together, but also making sure they get some rest, because as we know, not a lot of time elapsed from when we last, last saw the Lakers play a game. And he's keeping it no secret. I think he used the word he wants to master. That's his goal.
this balance between yes. not overworking and working them It'll enough. It all starts for real, though, in two weeks. And it's a tough schedule right out of the gate. Opening night, December 22nd against Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, and the Clippers. Christmas Day, Luka Doncic and the Mavs are in town, followed by the Timberwolves and Blazers. The Lakers head out on the road for the first time on December 30th to take on the Spurs. So, Brez, no game in the NBA is easy. We know that. But the Lakers didn't get any uh, favors in the first five games. What are you expecting to see from L.A. as the season begins? Well, I think we'll see LeBron and AD play those first two games, especially with the NBA rule that, hey, you have to play in the big TV games. Opening night, big TV game. Uh, three days later, Christmas night, big TV game. So those guys will be out there running around for sure. And then I don't know what we're going to see from them for the, for the next three games, if not beyond that. Uh, like you said, some tough games. I'm not sold on the San Antonio game, that fifth game being that tough. The Lakers actually played them three times over the span of about two or three weeks which I think is good for them. Uh, San Antonio kind of on the way down. Uh, no offense to uh, Popovich. Please don't uh, at me on it. <laughs> but uh, definitely the Lakers, uh, not an easy schedule to start the season. Yeah, and I, I just think you look at it, you know, obviously opening night against the Clippers, that's a big game. Everybody's going to be up for that. Everybody's going to play in that. You don't sit guys on Christmas. Like, that. that right. is a marquee day for the NBA. The Lakers will go out and they'll push uh, for those two games, it's that back to back with Minnesota and Portland, where I think you'll start to see Frank Vogel make those adjustments, whether certainly you know, somebody's going to sit on one side or the other of that back to back. I'd be I'd be shocked if that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Or at the very least, you'll start to see the rotation change a little bit. Frank uh, Vogel going deeper into the bench, playing different combinations. That's when it's going to start to get a little bit, uh, you know, a, a little bit more creative, I think might be the right <laughs> word there. Three games in, uh, in, in what is that, four, four nights, I believe? Yes, sir. BK, I want to stick with you on this because I think one thing that we got to give Frank Vogel credit for is he really made adjustments and made lineups and combinations works, work when he needed to last season. And so as he embarked, embarks on this new challenge of balancing who plays in the preseason, who doesn't, mixed with four new faces and trying to bring this whole thing together, you certainly have confidence that he's going to find and strike that right balance. I think that's, that's a great point, Allie, because you go back to last year, guys deep in the bench, Quinn Cook, Troy Daniels, Jared Dudley, they got minutes in the, you know, Vogel was really good at making sure that everybody stayed involved. It became particularly important when they got into the bubble and into the playoffs when they had to change lineups so much. I mean, there's, there's a lot that goes into it that's more than just, you know, keeping guys fresh or whatever it might be. And so, you know, you're going to see different floor combinations. You're going to see guys going deep into the bench with all of these new guys that they have to try to find the best combinations, to try to find the, the, the guys that work well together, because remember, they're playing every other day. There's not going to be a lot of practice time to figure out which five man units work the best. Um, so everybody's going to need to play. It's, it's important in a lot of ways. You know, we just showed a graphic with uh, four names on it, and it's still there. Okay, uh, Marcus Saul, Wesley Matthews, they're getting up in age a little bit. All right, we're not going to be seeing them playing uh, 30 minutes a night in these preseason games. But, you know, eventually they'll need to get in there. The guys I think we'll see more of are, are Harrell and, and Schroeder. Those are the two guys. They're young. They're in their 20s. Uh, they just signed big contracts. They're, 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 or they're hoping to sign big contracts maybe next season. Uh, they want to show everyone what they can do as quickly as possible with their brand new team. So I think those two guys will get some burn in the preseason. The other two, eh, I'm not sure about uh, Gasol and Wesley Matthews. Look, a lot of questions, but... Not a lot of time to figure it out. We're going to find out sooner or later yeah. how Frank Vogel and his staff handles the championships in NBA League history. The 2016 Cavs coming back from 3-1 versus 73-19, and 19, being down 3-1 versus one of the best teams that ever been assembled. Two-time MVP. Two-time MVP. Um, and then what we went through in a bubble. And if you were not in a bubble, you don't quite understand it. You would never, <clears throat> ever understand how hard it was to win that championship, to be able to motivate yourself to be out of, this is literally out of your whole comfort zone. No so, family, no, no family. I didn't see my family for eight and a half weeks. And then it was just my wife. Never, I didn't see my kids until I got out of the bubble, um, 96 days. You, everything you're accustomed to, your own bed or, or your chef, you know, your sleeping pattern, you know, you're so accustomed to, you know, for me, I'm a routine guy. And when my routine is like knocked off, I, I, it's like, I don't know, it's hard for me to center myself. So <laughs> I'm with you. I, like, I'm literally in a bubble at times, like in my room, l literally seeing the walls, like this, like the shining 
Just blood. Just blood. like blood <laughs> coming down my walls. I go in the hallway. It's like two kids on a tricycle. I'm like, oh, holy shit. What is going on? I got to go home. I'm yeah, ready to you leave. Know, you haven't seen The Shining. Uh, we want you to play with us. Yes. For, uh, you got to see ever. The Shining. It's ever. one of the greatest ever horror movies. I'm a horror movie connoisseur, guys. I'm sorry for the people that don't watch horror movies. But it felt like a horror movie Yeah. in the bubble. And I just believe that I've been a part of two of the hardest championships in league history. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't care what anyone says about that. You can, you can debate who's the greatest of all time individually, things of that nature and what they've done. But as far as the teams, that's one of the two hardest championships in league history I've been a part of that. All right, so let's talk about them. From coming back down three games to one on the 73-9 and nine Warriors in 2016, thinking about all that the Lakers faced in terms of adversity last season. Do you agree those are the two hardest titles won? Uh, absolutely. I, I mean, I dare someone to come up with two other ones. L look, I covered that uh, Golden State Cleveland series for the LA Times. Allie, I, I got tired just kind of going back and forth on the plane for from Oakland to Cleveland for all, all the games in that series. I mean, it was tense. It, it was uh, dramatic. And indeed, they were the first team ever to overturn a 3-1 deficit in the NBA Finals. That's that one. And of course, the uh, NBA season that we just uh, witnessed ending a couple months ago, the longest ever in, in uh, league history, maybe the longest of any season of all time anywhere. So yeah, LeBron is absolutely spot on when he says that. BK, as I pitched that question to Brez, I saw you shake your head yes as well. I, just, I, I don't know. I, look, I'm not a historian. I, I can't go back and, and break down the path for every beating the, the that Warriors team was a remarkable achievement. It's hard to find, particularly given what LeBron had to do on an individual level, the performance that was required to do it. You know, was this title that they just won in 2020, was that harder? Was their path harder? Did they have to play the hardest teams? I don't know, but the, it was it was unique relative to everything else that the NBA has ever done. There has never been a situation like that where the mental fatigue that goes into playing in that bubble, as LeBron pointed out, being away from your family for, what do you say, 95, 96 days, whatever that, you know, didn't see his kids, you're, you're out of your routines. Every, the isolation there, from a mental standpoint, it's hard to think of something that was more challenging than that, even if you think the Lakers didn't have the hardest path to get there based on their opponents. So, BK... LeBron compares being in that bubble to that of The Shining. I still haven't seen the movie. Are we surprised? No, no one's surprised. That was two weeks ago, and I still haven't watched it. So will you help me understand what he's talking about? Was the bubble really I that believe, bad? I believe the hotel they were staying at had a problem where every time you got off at the wrong floor, blood would come that's out of the elevator. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's probably what it yeah. was. Red rum. Red rum. <laughs> What's red rum backwards, Allie? Do you know? No. Well, Murder. There you go. Ah! There we go. They I, also the Morris, you know, like they have those creepy twins in 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 The Shining. they were the Morris brothers were there. I don't know. Maybe that's what he's talking about. <laughs> Do you think that the other Lakers felt the way that Braun felt as well? That yeah, it was like The Shining. Maybe not. Yeah. The they walls saw closing in blood. and pools of blood everywhere and, and, <laughs> and little and, tricycles. <laughs> I mean, Jack Nicholson is one of the biggest Laker fans of all time, so maybe he was trying to get into the bubble a little bit. But yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. You know, when, when you talk to people who who were in the bubble, whether it's reporters or coaches or players. It was unlike anything they ever experienced, and there was no doubt that this season was going to start without a bubble. Now, where are we, you know, eight months from now, seven months from now? Are we in a bubble situation for the, the final four uh, of the NBA or, or maybe the, uh, the playoffs? No one knows. But, uh, yeah, really, LeBron is right when he says we sacrificed a ton to be in Orlando for three full months. Not a lot of family time, not a lot of uh, good friends time. Just a lot of team time, and it worked out for them, but I'm sure they do not care to revisit that anytime soon. And again, as he said it, I won't question him. As he said it, if you weren't in there and you didn't experience you didn't that, it. 96 days, 95 nights, as he yeah. recalls, yeah. then you would never understand. <laughs> but he didn't get me to go watch The Shining. The both of you did just right now. So kudos to the both of you. Uh, sticking welcome. with LeBron, fresh off winning his fourth NBA title in 17 seasons, LeBron James is right back in the gym working harder than ever to get his fifth, something that hasn't gone unnoticed from new teammate Dennis Schroeder. Yeah, it's the 18th year, so uh, I don't even know what to say. It's, uh, and he's still one of the, you know, hardest working guys uh, in this in this uh, building. Um, he's here early, you know, leaving late. Um, I mean, it's just crazy to see, but uh, to be around him, you know, his presence, just how he, you know, practices, even off the court stuff, uh, what I've seen so far, 
um, treatment, all that stuff, you know, I just try to get better at me myself as well. So um, I think he is a big role model, you know, for everyone here um, to see, you know, that he's doing it for 18 years um, on the bigger stage. Um, and didn't slow down yet. So uh, everybody, you know, is watching him try to get better um, each day as well. No, that's a huge part of the of this year's plan is to to have Dennis out there with LeBron, uh, alleviating some of the pressure, but also his ability to play off the ball. That's what we love about him. Um, you know, they're going to see uh, you know heavy, heavy minutes uh, throughout the course of the year this this year. Uh, we haven't seen a ton of it yet in practice because most of our practice so far has been sort of like drill work more than live action, you know, or four on fours or, or things like that. But, um, you know, that, that combination is going to be one that, that we envision being a great one for us this year. BK, it's been three days and Dennis Schroeder has already picked up on the work ethic of LeBron James. We talked yesterday with Brez on the show about he and Dennis Schroeder working as tandem in that backcourt. How do you see it playing out? I think, look, the, the two numbers I think that are, are critical when you look at Dennis Schroeder when he plays with LeBron, because he's not going to have the ball in his hands as much as he normally would. 42.5% um, last year in Oklahoma City on uh, catch-and-shoot opportunities and almost 40% on wide-open threes. He's going to see a lot of both of those playing with LeBron James. He'll also be able to you know, do a little bit of what Rajon Rondo did last year Take, allowing LeBron to take some possessions off, you know, they'll it could have some some really interesting pick and roll patterns between those guys and whatever. But primarily, I think when they're on the floor together, one of his big contributions is going to be being out there as an outlet for LeBron to drive and kick and converting those three pointers. Frankly, at a higher rate than I think they they were at a, at a rate I should say they were hoping Danny Green would do it last year. Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to be be seeing LeBron setting a lot of screens down low so that Schroeder can kind of uh, direct him off those. Uh, it's probably more for like a Montrez Harrell with LeBron, but still, AK or BK, you hit a lot of good points there. Uh, these two are going to be really good in the backcourt together because both can handle the ball, both can shoot threes, both are pretty good mid-range, both can get to the basket. You know, Schroeder is deceptively good at getting to the cup despite being only six feet one. So I think they're going to be really good uh, with each other, whether they're on ball or off ball. doesn't matter who's going to have it. They'll, they'll be almost interchangeable in that sense. Uh, before we go to break, BK, we have something for you. Uh, 21 Pacific Division. No surprise, the Lakers are the favorites at minus 140. <laughs> The Clippers are right on their heels at plus 125. Uh -huh. The Warriors took a hit, losing Klay Thompson for the season, dropping their odds to plus 1,800, followed by the Suns and the Kings. So, Brez and BK, let's take a dip into the Pacific Division. Obviously, the Lakers are a favorite for a reason. They're the NBA champs. After all, I was a little surprised by the Clippers right behind them. Are they a legit title contender? Yeah. Brez? I, I mean, okay, not, not a good thing that they lost uh, Montrez Harrell, uh, especially to your down-the-hall uh, buddy, the Lakers. But I thought they, they did okay. They recovered quickly. Serge Ibaka, not a bad signing. The problem for them is going to be new coaching staff, all right? Uh, yet another season of, of underwhelming uh, finality. I mean, they lost again in the second round after being up 3-1. to one. Uh, this, this franchise just seems to have trouble getting out of its own way. And uh, let's not forget the Lakers improved, I would say, dramatically from uh, before last season started with the roster on paper as we speak. Look, I mean, it is, it is both <laughs> fashionable and, quite frankly, entertaining for <laughs> Lakers fans to, to mock the Clippers yeah, yeah. and uh, make fun of them and and look at everything that's gone wrong and i get it but look they have Kawhi leonard um they they have paul george and i think serge Ibaka actually is a better fit for those guys in terms of late game situations than montrez harrell was um you know particularly if you want to try to figure out a way to play lou williams as well so I, I, they are a very very good team the thing that i think is intriguing about the clippers is that the level of pressure on this team is unbelievable like right. you know everybody thought maybe you know if things go wrong with the lakers it would be them risking losing all their stars and this and that it's the clippers this year that if things go wrong this franchise is going to be in very bad shape uh, and so i think that actually could help them but could also hurt them if they face some adversity and, and look that's the thing is on paper as you guys both mentioned they are great and, and they look yeah. great but it's all about putting it together and last season we did not see that so We'll see how that looks for this season. Moving on to the Warriors. They, uh, we thought, were getting Steph and Clay back. And then, of course, they lost Clay to that Achilles tear. Uh, they'll be much improved, though. Do we see them being able to compete this year like we all expect?
Yeah, I kind of like the Vegas odds on them. You know, it's it's about right. They might be able to sneak into the playoffs, uh, maybe have to do a play-in situation to get there. Uh, but I, I like some of the other pieces they have. Obviously, Draymond back. Uh, Steph is back. Uh, I thought picking up Kelly Oubre, kind of a good under-the-radar acquisition. I also kind of like uh, Andrew Wiggins, uh, the former number one pick. I know he has not lived up to expectations, but getting him uh, towards the end of this past season, I thought that was a nice little move by them. And, and he's going to be okay down the road. And, of course, the number two over pick, overall pick, James Weissman, what, what's he going to do for them at the five? You know, some interesting pieces there. I just don't know if it means a, a top eight playoff spot when, when all is said and done. Yeah, I, the, the, the Clay's injury this year is probably it's the top. saddest thing that happened oh, to the okay. NBA. Awesome. Like, there's just no question about it. Um, and it took that team from being a legit contender to this sort of fringy playoff team. Kevin Pelton from ESPN has them 13th in his projections, which are analytics based and all that kind of stuff. And like Mike says, it gets down to like weird things like how good is James Wiseman? What does Kent Bazemore give you? Mm -hmm. How about Kevon Looney? Like you need <laughs> certain strange and surprising things are going to have to happen for the Warriors to jump back up into the you know, the top half of the conference. And I agree with Mike. They could struggle to make that top eight. All right, so the other two in the Pacific, the Suns and Thunder completed a surprising trade this offseason. Ten-time All-Star Chris Paul is back in the Pacific Division where he spent six years with the Clippers. This time, he is in Phoenix who traded four players in a 2022 first-round pick to get him. Now, BK, the Suns went a perfect 9-0. They were the talk of the bubble. Everyone loved watching what they were able to do, pairing CP3 with Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton. Do we see this working? I do. I, I, I think the Suns were a team that that were on, you know, that it's just like that. So I was about to say the Suns rising. That's terrible. And nobody should do that. You're better than that. But, you know, they, they were improving. That's a better way of doing it. And, you know, they needed pieces like Chris Paul, a uh, veteran piece like Jay Crowder to kind of come in here and, and help do that. The thing that I think helps them a great deal with that CP3 trade isn't just, um, you know, what they what they got. It's also what they kept. They kept Michael Bridges on the on the wing, who's an excellent defender and a good shooter. They kept Cam Johnson, who played surprisingly well as a shooter last year. There's a lot of talent on this team. And look at what CP did with Oklahoma City, a young group of guys last year. That team really outperformed expectations. I think that could happen again. Yeah, I like this team. If I was in Vegas, I'd probably put a buck on them to, to win the uh, the division. Pretty good odds for them, I thought. But another team, I don't know if they make the playoffs. I mean, they could be a, a top five or six team, and they could also miss out. There's just a lot of new things going on there. Uh, you saw the, the trade uh, graphic there. They gave up a lot of people to bring in really just one guy. Uh, I think it works. I, I kind of like Chris Paul and Devin Booker in the same backcourt. Some, some good young players in the front court. And I do like the Crowder pickup. That's going to help uh, the Suns guard guys like uh, LeBron and Kawhi, some of the more physical uh, threes in the league. I just don't know if it's enough. It's certainly going to be fun to watch. I'm really excited yeah, to see CP3. Yeah, yeah. What, what are they? We don't, we don't really know, do we? But it'll, it'll be entertaining. What's going on up north? Let's talk about that. Because um, yeah. it was an interesting offseason, to say the least, for the Sacramento Kings. Of course, what fell apart with Bogdan Bogdanovich uh -huh. in, in Milwaukee. And then they failed to match that four-year, $72 million offer sheet with the Hawks. BK, what's going on? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Rule number one of sign and trade. <laughs> Ask the guy if he wants to be traded to the place you're signing him to or whatever that is. That didn't go well. Uh, I don't know. I don't like they're not going to be good. They're not a top eight team. They're not a threat to win much of anything, but they do have some talent and you can squint a little bit and see, OK, if the, you know, if Marvin Bagley is healthy and plays well and, you know, De'Aaron Fox is a really fun young player and Bogdanovich being gone kind of removes the clutter in the way of Buddy Heald. And they love Tyrese Halliburton, the rookie that they drafted this year. You know, so like if everything lines up, maybe they they're in that top 10. They have a chance to, to play their way in. Um, but it's like every year in Sacramento. I don't know. I don't know what's going on up there. Nobody knows what's going on up there. <laughs> yeah, BK and Allie, a tough second year apparently on the horizon for, for Luke Walton. Uh, I don't know if I put a dollar on the Kings to, to win the Pacific Division. You know, just so many question marks up there. Bogdanovich, uh, the failure to match that contract, definitely a minus in the column. They had some injuries last year. You know, maybe, maybe Marvin Bagley does come back and show a little bit of what he did two seasons ago, but uh, just too many question marks. And uh, too good of a division for my money, the best in the NBA. All right, great rundown from the both of you of the Pacific Division. One question for you. I'll start with you, BK. Which one do you think is most likely to challenge the Lakers? Of those teams, it's Phoenix. Wow. What? Over the Clippers. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. Well, I forgot. Oh. That. I thought you meant like the. <laughs> See, I told you, Clippers slander. I, I, you know, hey, we were so he brings a Clippers different here, dynamic. I thought you meant the dark horse teams. And I look, I'm going to try to cover for the fact that I forgot the Clippers were one option. I was, you know, but yes, it's the Clippers. But once you get past the obvious answer, the one that Brez was probably going to take, because that's just the lane he stays in, um, then it's the Suns. BK, there's going to be some blood coming down off those walls. For, for <laughs> it's really going to feel like The Shining real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a clicker, uh, Clippers, no doubt about it. Uh, like I said, lost a little bit with, with the Montrez uh, situation, but a uh, good save with Ibaka. And they're still, they still got two all-stars, perennial all-stars on that team. It's the Clippers that could challenge the Lakers. Did you see our reaction to BK? <laughs> the Suns without a doubt. What? Uh, you forget one, so you forget one team that also happens to play in the same city <laughs> as yours. And you, everybody makes fun of you. <laughs> oh, you best. said it, not us. The first half. Danny Green on Instagram today. He said, thank you to my Lakers family, the city of L.A., and Laker fans everywhere for welcoming me to your city and your team. We had one job, and we made it happen. I'll never forget my time as part of the Lake Show, and I have all of you to thank for it. Special shout-out to my teammates and coaching staff for an unforgettable season. How about this, guys? Thank you to the Spectrum Sportsnet hey. team for helping inside the green room do our thing and for being great partners. On to the next chapter. Very classy. Appreciate that. Uh, and this tweet from the Lakers today that purple and gold is a perfect fit. Mark Gasol. Pretty Earlier succinct. today, <laughs> Frank Vogel talked about the role Mark Gasol and Montrose Harrell will play on this year's Lakers roster. They could play at least the roles that, that JaVale and, and Dwight did from a minute standpoint, uh, maybe more. You know, I think that's something that will just play out over the course of the season. Um, but we still would like to have a blend of, of AD uh, playing at the four uh, and as well as playing at the five, which is you know, obviously something uh, our ability to shift back and forth uh, in the playoffs last year was pivotal and, and, and important to us winning the championship. And, um, you know, something that we'll uh, it will balance again uh, this season. I think in these first couple of days of camp, we kind of just uh, toy with it a little bit. Um, you know, me playing some five, me playing some four. Let's say Marcus, you know, defense player of the year. You know, he can, he can you know, guard bigger guys. Um, and then, you know, Trez is a fighter. I mean, we know we lost two guys who, you know, Javel and Dwight who played our five spot, but I think we got two guys, you know, who, um, you know, one can be undersized. Um, but has a lot of dog and a lot of fight to, to play against anybody, guard anybody. Um, and then, you know, obviously in you know, certain cases, I'll also play the five. So, um, you know, just not, and I mean, this, this season is cut short. This season is a lot different from any other season. Well, I won't say any other, because last year was a different season. But, um, you know, we'll mix it in and, and, you know, take it game by game and just see well, what happens. You know, we were very successful when I was at the five. So maybe it's something that we, you know, kind of wait for the playoffs again. Um, and then you know, during the course of the season, you know, kind of toy with it, you know, game by game. All right, BK. So you've got Anthony Davis, Mark Gasol, and Montrez Harrell. How do you see the workload between those three splitting up? <laughs> well, it, it, this is going to be one of the more fascinating challenges for, for Vogel this year is – Figuring that out because you do need to protect Marcus All from a minute standpoint. AD doesn't love to play a ton of minutes at the five if he can avoid it. You know, down the stretch of games, it's okay, but not all all night long. Mm -hmm. And Montrez Harrell, at least to this point in his career, has had some defensive issues um, in terms of you know rim protection and things like that. Good drawing charges, but not a great defender, at least by reputation. So. Can you make Harrell better by playing him next to Davis with, you know, a, a, the short guy playing the five and the tall guy playing the four? Like, how much can you do with Marcus All? This is going to be the hard thing to figure out. You know, wouldn't shock me if later in the year they picked up one more big. But don't forget, too, they can stay pretty long with with Markeith Morris and LeBron James, a pretty big guy, too. Markeith, yeah, that's a name we saw during mm -hmm. the playoffs that really made a difference on that end of the floor. Uh, Brez, let's stick with Anthony Davis for a second, because the very first time we heard from him during his press conference, he made it very clear he doesn't want to play the center. <laughs> now, he did it when he needed to, and he was great at it. Where do you see him playing his most minutes? Um, at the four. You, you know, okay. it's funny. Uh, statistically, he's actually better at the five, but yeah. <laughs> you want to listen to your star player, and if he says, I don't love playing the five, you put him at the four uh, until the last few minutes of a game or, or playoffs or the championship or, or whatever. 
Uh, you know, it was kind of funny when, when I asked Frank Vogel today on Zoom, how are you going to see it playing out? It, it was like it was fourth and 27 because Frank punted that ball as quickly as you, can, as you can imagine. It's not ready for him to talk about that yet. And I get it. It's only, what, day three of training camp? But eventually he'll make a decision. I think maybe we will see Marcus Saul start and maybe uh, keep Montrez Harrell coming off the bench. But it's not our, our, our decision. We'll, we'll see what Frank does. Speaking of Montrez, a bit undersized. Sure. But don't underestimate Six the dog eight, in right? him, Six, right? Seven? Yeah. That's why you don't have much concern. Or do you with that lack of size? You think of last year when they had Dwight Howard and JaVale, two real strong, big interior yeah. guys. It's a different if it's a different feel because because JaVale and Dwight, shop lockers, uh, played above the rim. And don't get me wrong, Montrez does too. But, you know, uh, JaVale's a legit seven-footer. That is not the case with Montrez. Uh, Dwight is listed at 6'11". He's probably closer to 6'9 and three quarters, but still uh, definitely a guy. They, they love going back and forth and, and trying to get the alley-oops and everything. But, you know, it's a different thing with Montrez. He's just not the size of a normal center. It, it's a good problem to have. Still a very gifted player. We'll, we'll see how it, how it shakes out. BK, from the bigs to just the ability to space the floor, I'd say that the Lakers got even better than they did last season and they won a championship. What do you like about the floor spacing? I think, you know, you're, you're talking about the bigs. I think one of the, the, the big additions that they made was Marcus Gasol's ability to, to to shoot the three. Like, you know, I know there were some questions about how he was reluctant to do it with the Raptors last year in the bubble, but he's still somebody that you have to honor that shot out there. So I think that's going to help them. It's going to add some diversity to the offense. There's no question in that way. Um, you know, Wes Matthews is an excellent shooter. We talked earlier in the show about the, 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 the numbers that Dennis Schroeder put up last year as both a catch-and-shoot guy and as a spot-up guy on wide-open threes. When you play with Anthony Davis and LeBron James, you're going to get those opportunities. And all around the floor, throughout the rotation, with the exception of Montrezl Harrell, basically everybody that they added is somebody who can shoot the ball. And I, I think that will make a difference. Trade a little bit of defense. Uh, for better offense, and I think overall it'll help. And, and by the way, Montrez's motor is just so strong. It doesn't matter if he's 6'7 or 6'11. He doesn't quit. St still, still very tough. Uh, a bulldog. He will show up every single night. This is why we say the Lakers, though they won a championship, whew, did they get better. Amazing. And more. Amazing. ESPN has revealed the first half of their top 100 current NBA players. Four Lakers have made the list so far. New additions, Montrez Harrell, Dennis Schroeder, and Mark Gasol are on the list at number 76, 77, and 96, while KCP checks in at number 77. We knew the offseason was an A-plus for the Lakers, guys, but adding three of the league's top 100, that's kind of amazing, Bruss. Yeah, uh, where's Kuz, by the way? Need to get him uh, out there, see if, uh, if he can sneak in uh, the top 50. I'm not sure it's going to happen, but it, indeed, uh, this team didn't ha did not have a lot of trade capital, okay? It's not like they had a bunch of, of lottery picks uh, sitting there waiting to be dealt uh, uh, last month when Rob Plink has started putting this team together. What an amazing deal he did. Get, getting four guys who are going to be difference makers, maybe not every night, but certainly an overwhelming number of nights. One, two, three, or even four of them are going to jump up and help contribute to this team. It makes sense that these guys are all in, in the 51 to 100 portion of the ESPN uh, Top 100. BK, how impressive is this? It's, it's really impressive with the level of talent. First of all, you know, Brez, you talk about uh, Koo sneaking in there. I think a lot of Lakers fans are, are assuming that Alex Caruso is in the top 50. <laughs> They're going to start throwing elbows around. Great but line. I, to me, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the thing that strikes me with that ranking is where Contavious Caldwell focused. Because remember, yes. when he was signed, this was, you know, for all the, the talk of Mono from Heaven and all these other things, it was not, con he was considered a guy that was sort of you know, paid a little bit for the clutch, the, whatever it might be. And the, the way he's contributed and become so crucial to this team's success, um, the, the, I, I, I think it's fantastic for him. It's a validation of all the work he puts in. Uh, and I'm excited to see him on that list. But it does say he's going to have to be a big contributor this year um, because, mm -hmm. you know, look where he is. This is a guy who's expected now to play very well. So we know that the Lakers are probably pretty excited about this list, but there's some people that aren't excited about this. Uh, how about this? DeMar DeRozan, that LA <laughs> native we were talking about, doesn't agree much with being ranked at number 82. He tweeted this. Bruz, do you know what those emojis are? Spell it out for us, Sally, would you? What's going on there? Uh, I got the clown part. I got the clown part. <laughs> clown poop. <laughs> hey, thanks, BK. Yeah, uh, DeMar not really That's excited right. about that, is he? He's a pretty solid player, too. But, uh, Yes, Penn, uh, they didn't love him on their list, did they? Uh, do we have any any problems with the list so far? I, I saw I saw a couple. I thought uh, Tyler Hero was a little high. I think he came in at 59. 
He's a good player. You know, he's coming off his rookie season, did some good stuff in the bubble, but 59, a little high for me. And then at 54, former Laker Lonzo Ball. This guy averaged, what, seven points in the bubble, uh, kind of was, was kind of picking on uh, re reporters. He was at 51, I'm told, uh, kind of picking on reporters uh, with some tweets after they kind of disparaged his play in the bubble. Yeah, I thought those two guys were a little too high. What about you, BK? I don't know. I, mean, I think DeMar DeRozan is probably not the 82nd best player in the NBA, but Lonzo Ball was excellent for my fantasy team last year. So I do have to give him credit for that. And if that's what it takes, uh, you know, that's where it lands him for doing me right last year, then I'm okay with it. Let's have fun. It's all about you. Because it's only the bottom it is, half. Yes, Mike, it is all about me. That's exactly right. I agree. Excuse me, the back half, I should say, of the top 100. So the top 100, we know that LeBron and AD will be on this list. Yes. Where will they be on this list? Well, Prediction. I looked it up last year. LeBron was three and AD was five. I think they're going to go two and three this year. I'll tell you why. Whoa. The media seems to have a fascination with putting Giannis atop lists and atop awards and atop voting situations. I have a feeling he'll be the number one. He was last season, but I think I could see LeBron bumping up to two and AD moving up to three. Perez has some infatuation obsession with Milwaukee, and I just, <laughs> I don't understand. Do you think LeBron will be one? I think they'll be one and two. Wow. BK, okay. what do you think? Okay. I think I think I've, maybe it's a deep-seated hatred of Laverne and Shirley. We got to <laughs> investigate this with Brez a little bit more. I think one and three. I think LeBron will be one, be one, and I think AD is three. But what's fascinating to me, guys, is the idea that that could flip-flop, where AD Ooh. not that LeBron would drop three, but where AD might be considered the one by the end of the season. That's the dream scenario for the Lakers. Okay, so I'm going to ask both of you then. What is it going to take for LeBron to be one? He, he might be. He, he might okay. be. Uh, you know, I'm sure maybe the ESPN guys who are putting this together are saying, well, you know, Giannis is so good at both ends of the court. You know, I, I would say he, he's not winning. You know, he hasn't got to the NBA Finals yet. So if you want to talk about winners, and LeBron really improved defensively last season, no doubt about it, that maybe LeBron and AD should be one and two and kind of punish Giannis for, for uh, not winning, make him three or four, you know, whatever you want to do with that. Yeah, I'm not one of these guys who gets all over people for calling somebody the second best player in the NBA as opposed to like that's, Some people that's do. not exactly <laughs> slander. I know, I get it, but it, that's not exactly slander. But I mean, Giannis is really good. It's it's not a crime to put LeBron right behind Giannis. It's that group of like top five guys. Who? Where do you draw the line between that super elite group um, of you know LeBron, Giannis, and now the, again the big thing is. Anthony Davis is in that group. Last year, he wouldn't have been. This year, he is. And I think that's what makes the Lakers so difficult to deal with around the league is they have two of those guys. And what, what do you do with Harden, too? No one knows what's going to happen with him in Houston. Yeah, a lot, lot, lot of weirdness in the top five. Pencil potential. it in. The Lakers are going to win the championship next season. BK said that LeBron can be number two. That's all the motivation he needs. <laughs> Done. Hey, Done. It, it, Motivation it works, station. <laughs> and you're going to take all the credit for it. <laughs> Lakers basketball is back on Friday. The first of four preseason games is Friday at 7 o'clock against the Clippers. They'll play again on Sunday. The final two preseason games are December 16th and 18th in Phoenix. You can see all of these games right here on Spectrum Sportsnet.